Welcome everybody to the data science user group. We're excited that you're here. I know some people are still online, but we're going to get going for the sake of time. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, we meet usually the first Friday of each month at noon here. We have free lunch provided. Uh, we're very thankful for the research park staff, which helps put this on. Um, and the goal of this user group is really just to foster collaboration around data science in the community. And today we have two uh, amazing presentation. I'm excited to hear both of them. First up, we have uh, Joe Yoon, and he heads up the Social Research and Technology Innovation Lab um, at the university. So he's going to be talking about social media analytics. So will you please join me in welcoming Joe. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joe, and I'd like to present on a project. Uh, this is an open source project that we've been working on in my lab for a couple of years. So um, this is a link to a Medium blog post um, that has a little bit more context, but um, when I was going through my doctorate education, I did my doctorate in informatics. My background before that was a computer science bachelor's and uh, advertising and social psychology master's. And so I had kind of a mix between computer science and social science. And while I was doing my doctorate, I kind of spanned between North Campus and South Campus frequently. And so when I would be speaking with a researcher that doesn't necessarily have a computer science background, there's you know, many researchers, um, I kind of have a conversation like this with them. So they'd say something like, I have this research question I'm trying to solve. I want to use social media to try to solve that research question. But I think it'll take many years to create an algorithm that'll do et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would say, oh, actually, did you know that there's an algorithm that was created by a researcher literally right on this campus um, that does exactly that? And then that researcher would say, this is amazing. How do I use that algorithm? And then I'd say, well, all you gotta do is read this research paper, go to this GitHub, take the code that's not fully finished, branch it, edit it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we stare at each other, smile, conversation generally fades off, and then we just say but goodbye. <laughs> then, another day I'd be on north side of campus, and I'd be speaking with a CS researcher, and they'd say, I have this amazing algorithm that detects such and such on social media data. It has X accuracy, F1 score is Y, and it won Z competition, and i say, awesome. Okay, out of curiosity though, how do you know when this algorithm is good enough to be used to answer and apply social science research questions? Because I'm positive there's many researchers out there that could really use this algorithm, um, but are we at a point where we can use it? And the researcher says, wow, I, I don't know, but this sounds exciting, how do we test this? And then I'd say, well, you could potentially take your code, harden it a bit, document it, put it up on a, a website with a, G, a GUI interface that a non-programmer could use. I think we could really have people use it. And they'd say, okay, <laughs> smile, conversation fades off, and then we bid each other a, a farewell. And I'd have these conversations just over and over and over again. And so the computer scientist in me and the social scientist in me decided, I'm just gonna create something that helps fix this, right? This was not my dissertation to the chagrin of my advisor. <laughs> But I decided, all right, I'm doing my dissertation here, but this is something that I just want to do as a, as a passion because there's so many people out there that could use these mathematical models that don't have a CS background, and I, would, I want to create something that'll enable them to do that. And so this is kind of the high-level overview, um, the napkin drawing uh, of what we created, and which is basically uh, what we call, hopefully, the most, uh, we just, this is kind of aspirational, the most advanced, open, fully open, social media analytics platform for research in the world. And so we had three types of people in mind when we created this uh, platform. First is a social researcher, and, and we thought about, okay, and, and again, this is not necessarily mutually exclusive. There's people that have interdisciplinary skills now, but just for illustrative purposes, you know, we're splitting this up, right? So the social researcher, what are they most concerned about? First, they're most concerned about ease of use. They, they, they don't want to become a computer scientist to answer a research question. Right? And they have the intelligence to do so, but it just, that, that takes time, that takes you know, resources. You know, why, right? Um, so you have things like Facebook and Twitter for social media that have built-in analytics. But the problem with those built-in analytics is how did they conduct their sentiment analysis? How did they create their topic models? There's absolute lack of transparency in the methodology. So that forms the other axes, which is basically um, to use algorithmic methods for social media research that is academic research, you need transparency of what, how they created that model. Um, but most things out there, they're not gonna give you that. They're, they're all black box. 
If you want transparency, you've got to learn Python, R, and then again, you've got to do that process that I explained. You've got to read the CS paper, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the macroscope functions as something that kind of sits in that quadrant where nothing else exists. Well, how about that computer science researcher? Because I had to convince my computer science colleagues to put their models into our environment. Um, well, what are they interested in? Well, many things, but two things that are very, very important to them is breadth of social media data access. So it's really hard to get social media data nowadays to research. It's expensive, you have to buy it. And so one of the, the carrots that I presented to my colleagues was, hey, if you put your stuff into my environment, um, I'll get access to more data. I will buy more data. We've got current uh, contracts with certain companies. We're pulling data in, um, and that'll help your research. But also, again, this whole aspect of, is your model applicable to applied research questions on humans, right? If we're talking about social media data, does your model output something that can really answer a social science question um, well? And so there's nothing out there that kind of enables, again, this, even from a computer science perspective. Um, and so that's kind of where the social media microscope fits. Um, actually, the third type of research, I did put it on here because I didn't know the, the scope of the audience here, but the third type of research I thought about was all these people that are practitioners in industry. There's a lot of companies out there that do social media analytics and a lot of companies that have platforms that analyze social media data. But I can tell you two things about those platforms. One, they're extremely expensive to use. You're going to have subscriptions that are probably like 30 to 50 to 100 to multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to use them. And secondly, everything in those platforms is black box because that's the nature of, of, of companies, right? It's proprietary. Um, but the problem with data science is that black box is not acceptable, at least in my opinion especially because it really matters how you built the model, what data you used, what algorithm you used, how much data was in there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so even from an industry perspective, I believe that this environment will be helpful um, to industry practitioners as well. And so this was many years in the making, uh, but now we have a working prototype up at uh, www.socialmediamacroscope.org, and that word macroscope, something in between a microscope and a telescope. Um, and it's, it's live right now. Now, what really is the macroscope? The macroscope in itself is not a tool. It's more like an app store. So if you can imagine an app store on your phone, an app store just has a bunch of various apps, and those apps do different things. The macroscope, or the vision of the macroscope, is it's really just a, an environment where people can build their open source tools that analyze social media data and put it into this one-stop shop environment. And so it becomes kind of this place, this clearinghouse, of all the social media analytics apps out there that are open source. We, we built two in our lab just to get it started. The two that we built are called Smile and Bay. Smile is the social media intelligence and learning environment, and Bay is the brand analytics environment because my research um, is uh, dealing with marketing and advertising. So if any of you are, are CS folks, um, we, we welcome more apps. Now, I just want to talk about a little bit of um, high-level architecture of this system before I'll show you a working demo. And then can somebody signal me when my 15 minutes is up? I can just stop at any time. Um, this is a high level architecture. We wanted to create a website that people could go to. And you don't have to know anything about supercomputing or, or cloud computing or whatever to use this thing. It just looks like a website. But on the back end, um, there's various components that, that we had to build in behind this website. Of course, we had to have certain data servers that would pull in data. We had to have um, compute. And the way we're doing compute, just because, again, we're trying to do things as, as low cost as possible since, you know, academia doesn't have that, that much money, right? So um, we're, we're experimenting with serverless compute. For example, we use AWS Lambda and AWS Batch um, to do the very small tasks, right, um, when it comes to compute. On the front end, you know, we're, we're using all these open source packages, jQuery, um, uh, Bootstrap CSS, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to provide the, open, uh, the front end of our website. And then of course we've got various storage flavors for wherever you want to store your data. We have S3 buckets, you know, we've got, you can use your consumer storage, Google Drive, Dropbox Box, also NCSA Clouder, which is a um, scientific storage uh, open source project. Okay, so with all that said, I don't know if I'm talking really fast, but I want to show you the system. So, everybody see this? This is socialmediamacroscope.org. And again, um, we've got two tools right now, Smile and Bay. And so we'll, 
launch smile. Now, right when I clicked launch here, um, what happened was there's an EC2 actually out in Purdue. Um, that's a long story. Um, and it's got a containerized version of Smile. That containerized version was just launched right now, and it was presented to us as a website. Now you're in Smile, which is a social media intelligence and learning environment. And we kind of walk you through, you can search social media, you can do various things like NER, phrase mining, text classification. We, we tried to make machine learning for text classification intuitive and visual. Um, network analysis, natural language processing, Sentiment analysis, which is just a subset of some of this stuff, but it's popular, so we just pulled it out um, and storing your data. <coughs> now, I want to just walk through an example just to uh, show you how easy this is. So first, you want to pull Twitter data. You need like data science skills to even do that, right? Because you got to figure out how to go to the developer section of Twitter. You got to get an API key. What is an API, et cetera, et cetera. How about instead you make it as simple as this? You just get a pop-up box that looks like this. <laughs> Right, that we're all familiar with. And you click on authorize your app, you get a pin, you go back to the site, you put in your pin, and now you've just authenticated against Twitter's API and you can pull data from them, right? Now, I am a data scientist. I know how to do these things via Python. It is way easier for me to do this, so now I just do this, <laughs> right? I'd rather do this than, than Python at this point. Uh, we'll skip these, because um, just for time's sake. And so, now we, we present, to you, uh, like a Google-like search bar, you choose tweets, and this morning I did a search on William Barr, um, just because he's being discussed a lot right now, right? And then you just click on search, and you can save it as a CSV file, um, which is another nice thing about the system, is everything is made to, oh, I created the thing, William Barr. William Barr 1. Um, even for just doing quick CSV pulls of data, I go to Smile now rather than running Python code. And so now it's authenticating against, authenticating against Twitter's API, pulling the data, and then it'll present it to us um, in, in a format that we can analyze. We ask for citations like crazy in this tool because currently um, we've got funding from this campus um, and I would like to self-sustain this over time. And so part of it is proving its, its worth and its usage. Um, so you can see previews here of the various tweets that have been pulled. Now you can decide, all right, I want to use various analytics tools to analyze these tweets about William Barr. You can do name entity recognition, phrase mining, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you phrase mining and show you how this works. So first, you pull the file, wbar, and then um, you select the algorithm. There's only one algorithm right now, but I want to show you how we decided to handle these kind of things. This is uh, Jingbo Shang's, and this is actually from Jai Wei Han's lab here at U of I. I, think, I believe this was his dissertation. But what we do is, what is phrase mining? You can literally read the whole paper on this model, right? And you can decide, is this the appropriate model to use for what I'm analyzing? You can learn everything about it, right? This is the opposite of black box. This is fully transparent, and we got everything in here. But now, if you want to go to use it, if you go to their GitHub, the code isn't even finished, right? So you can't actually use it. And if you're somebody that doesn't have a CS background, it's like basically impossible at this point to use the model. But instead, what did we do? We just said, we're gonna build it into the microscope and you just click on submit here. Now, if I click on submit, it's gonna take a while because this takes a while to run, but I ran it before and it's within my history here. And, and sorry it looks like this, it's the projector ratio. Um, if I go to automated phrase mining and I pull up, uh, William Barr here. Phrase mining has run. And here's a list um, in, in percentages of probabilities, right? So Matt Whitaker, Brian Williams, Corey Brooker, Rod Rosenstein. And, and by the way, his whole model was about how do you detect with an unstructured text or, or text that's you know, human readable but not necessarily computer readable easily, how do you detect what is supposed to be a single word and what's supposed to be a phrase, right? And he used, to, used a word embedding technique to be able to understand you know, what are considered phrases and what are not, what are considered just single words. Um, but this is pretty powerful. I mean, you even have House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff, right? That was pulled out first as these are related to one another, right? Instead of just doing a stamped version of words and then, and then showing a frequency of those words. How am I doing on time here? A little bit more? Okay. So 
You've also got things like um, network analysis, right? Simple enough, we're using a, a Python network X package here for this one. Um, and again, um, let's just do mentions, and then we'll do a Fruchterman layout. But again, you have the paper that you can read to understand how this all works. So that, one, you can cite it, which is helpful for academic research or required. But secondly, you can learn about it, right? Understand what's going on here. But then, you don't have to learn Python to run it. You just run it, and again, this, is, this takes time, so I'll just go to the history. Um, I'll go to my point uh, format. And right here, you've got the network that's run. Um, you can analyze it. We actually um, enabled it so that you could pull it out to Plotly, and you can um, do various things on Plotly, and so on and so forth. So this is just kind of a, a preview of what Smile can do. Smile is fully open source. Um, the code's out there, um, and, and people can put in whatever they want. But again, this is just one tool within the social media microscope. Um, the other tool, currently Bay, is a tool where um, I wrote a research paper in which I was asking the question after Cambridge Analytica, does this whole machine learn calculation of human personalities, and then using those human personalities to match with other people and then change your text according to those personalities really work, right? Well, to test that, I took what I programmed and made it into a tool and then presented it into the microscope so that there could be research reproducibility, people could build on top of this research, and so on and so forth. My actual hope is um, this becomes part of a way for academia to provide tools so that research can be reproduced and built upon in this stage, in this day and age where computational skills are almost absolutely required now to do a lot of this new research. Um, and so we're hoping to be somewhat of the, the middle ground to enable people to, to do this type of research. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is how expensive is it to get Twitter data from GNIP? So I think GNIP was re brought into Twitter now, so they're called Twitter data. Um, so what we're pulling is public API data, which is free. Um, GNIP data, I mean, for example, the other day I, I estimated out, a, 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 we're looking at a e, uh, Zika crisis tweets, and we did a quote, and it was like $500,000 for the data, <laughs> which is just crazy. Um, we also have a subscription in my lab to Crimson Hexagon, which is an analytics company that has <laughs> bought all of Twitter's data and then data warehoused it and then now presents uh, GUI interfaces that are all black box um, and sells that subscription. That access is $50,000 a year for me, um, but then I can use that to actually pull data. So that's kind of our non-illegal way, but different way to pull data in. Um, but it's, it's very expensive. Correct. Yep. Yeah, you can just put in um, a Boolean search query. I want these phrases, but not this phrase, et cetera, et cetera. And then it'll put it. uh, yes, there's, if you go to advanced on the search, then it'll be by geolocation. But most tweets are not geolocated. People turn it off. But, um, right now, we have Twitter and Reddit and a connector to Crimson Hexagon. Um, we are building right now a connector to Media Cloud from the MIT project, because I've, I've been talking with their team pretty closely. Um, so we'll have news data. Um, and then the connector to Crimson Hexagon will give you access to other data if you buy a subscription. Um, but Reddit, we just downloaded all of Reddit. We just finished downloading all, all of Reddit, and then we're going to warehouse that and uh, present that. Can I authorize via Twitter to so that mean I'm using my own Twitter to access this data? Correct. So part of the whole, one of the, the focuses of this project also is responsible data science, which includes like legal data science. Um, so part of it is we're really cognizant of all the, the terms of service rules that these companies have with their data, like Twitter. And so everything in this um, system, we built it around, you're not going to be able to do anything that's like against their terms of service. But part of that is you have to go there and read their terms of service, which we, 
expect you to do when you sign up for an, API, um, for, for an account. You don't need an API account, you just need your Twitter account, right? Now if that's skipped over, you know, we're figuring out what are ways that we can you know, remind people throughout the system as to you can. Don't take this data and store it on your local GitHub and then present it as a publication because that's, that's against terms of service. <laughs> Um, it, it depends on what you're what you're analyzing, but um, the goal is for the system to do most of the organization for this. And I do want to make a note: the whole idea of this project is we want to keep it absolutely free for non-commercial research forever. Um, but if um, we've already been contacted contacted by a couple of companies that are thinking about using this, so we're trying to figure out for companies a lower cost, like very not, nothing compared to what's out there, but just something so that we can self-sustain this research and grow. It. Um, but the goal is for non-commercial research, um, so nonprofits, academic research, um, that it would be a free environment. Where, where do you want this to be? Like, what's your vision for this? Like three to five years out. So my my evil plan um, is actually three to five years out. I'd like for this to be not just the most advanced open social media analytics platform, but the most advanced social media analytics platform in the world. Um, my goal is not to put those other companies out of business, but my goal is to force those other companies to be more responsible with their data science methodology. Um, because black box is just not gonna cut it moving forward. It just, uh, it's dangerous actually in some senses. Any other questions? Yeah, I Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Yes. Not only that, we already have some of that right now. I just didn't show it. You can actually open up a terminal in the web web uh, browser, and then you can actually manipulate things directly. Okay. Um, so, like, if you're like an advanced user, yeah. you can just go straight into the terminal that's presented on the web page. Right. It's kind of cool. Very handy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of my requirements. Just still, you got to give us a hook in there. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, thanks again, Joe. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Rajiv Shah. So, Rajiv, this is actually his, I think his third time speaking. So, he's setting a record here. I mean, the first time we've had a somebody back for a third time because we've loved him so much. So he is a data scientist uh, at Data Robot, and he also is very active in the uh, data science community in Chicago, uh, helps out with a, a group up there. And he also is a PhD graduate from the University of Illinois, so he has a lot of ties around various parts of Illinois. So please join me welcoming Rajiv. This is great, and actually I think there's a lot of tie-ins between kind of the earlier talk and what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so today's is going to be kind of a fun project. What I want to do is just walk through building a simple machine learning um, model for predicting song popularity. And so the motivation comes out of this is I work for a company called Data Robot. We've got hundreds of data scientists, and when the company was founded, um, the the kind of the founder who, who was a data scientist, kind of actuary, he was convinced that we would not need a sales force. We built a cutting edge thing, it was so cool, don't need a sales force. People would see it and instantly buy it. Now for those of you who've worked within enterprises, it doesn't work that easily for selling stuff. And along the way, we've had a sales staff develop, and part of that has been a marketing team. And so the marketing team is always pounding us data scientists for, can you do help us do different promotions? So around the Grammys, they were like, hey, can you build a model for song, for song popularity, right? For the Oscars, they're like, hey, can you build a model for movie popularity? The sales guys, on the other hand, 
are busy this weekend waiting for us to come out with our Kentucky Derby winners, because we have the models running right now to help predict that. So that's part of the kind of the fun things we like to do with machine learning. And that's what I wanted to just walk through a simple problem like this with just like the earlier talk, a little bit more emphasis on the front end of how we build up, set up that model, and then on the back end, how we understand the model. And this is a fun concept to understand some popularity. How does that sound? And so, and like many good data scientists, I'm gonna steal, borrow from others. So this is actually my buddy Taylor actually did a blog post on this one. He also did one on Game of Thrones as well. So I'm largely just pulling from his. If you kind of Google up um, the song Popularity by Taylor, there's a long blog post on the Data Robot website that talks about how he's built this out. So the data we're gonna to use today comes from Spotify. Probably all or most of you are familiar with Spotify, I'm not gonna really focus on that. One of the nice things that Spotify has is when we're talking about APIs, where should I not stand here? Um, Spotify has a nice API that allows you to access its data. And the interesting thing here is you not only get the data about, let's say, what songs are out there, how popular they are, but Spotify has also created some features or variables about the type of music, some acoustic signals in there. So for example, you can get things on how danceable a song is. And so this is some of the features that Spotify has generated that come into use that are useful when we go to build that machine learning model, right? Because this is an important part of whenever you build that machine learning model, you want to sit with your subject matter experts, your domain experts, and figure out what's important to that problem. And that's kind of what our starting point here is. Folks with me so far on this? Okay. All right, so there's a nice R package um, there's probably a Python version two that you can get to help pull the Spotify data. So this is unfortunately not built in and easy one-click access. You gotta do the R. Um, so. Once you do that, then it's very easy to take advantage of this package to be able to, for example, pick an artist, pick a song, be able to quickly get the information about that for analysis. Um, so what we wanted to do was answer the question, what makes a song popular? And the way we kind of looked at this was, we took all of the songs from the artists who've been there since back to 2010. Right? We know music in the 50s is a little bit different than now, so it didn't make sense to go back right, 50 or 60 years from this. It's always kind of an element of the many problems. Spotify has a built-in popularity measure that we used as our target. This is that historical data to help us learn from. And then we started off with an initial set of features, things like what genre the music is, the name of the artist, all the lyrics, it's taking advantage of that unstructured data, song title, that's that sort of information. And that was a starting for, point for kind of building out a model. So let me switch over to kind of the model here. We're gonna skip over It's going to look horrible on the screen, isn't it? Okay. Um, so what I want to do is walk through. We built out the model. It's probably unreadable in the back here. But, um, and we're not going to focus on how we built the model, but what I want to do is just start talking about now that we've built a machine learning model that understands the relationship between song popularity and all these other factors, how can we start learning from it? So one of the things is, we'll take advantage of the word cloud here. So it might be hard for folks in the back to be able to see this. But what this is, is it just shows the relationship between genre and popularity. So the bigger the word, the more often it shows up, the darker is the words that relate to popularity. So here you can see things like rap and pop much more likely to be popular. While the ones that are multiple words, things like, for example, post-teen pop, those are really small genres, less likely to be popular. 
So the lesson is, if you want something popular, stick to one of the main kind of genres, things like hip hop and pop. If you, for example, are going into kind of, right, southern hip hop, less likely that your song is gonna be popular. So then we also took a long it took a took a look at the song <laughs> took a look at the song lyrics here, and there are some interesting insights here. So again, the words "red" are ones for popularity. You'll see that there's quite a bit of profanity in here for the words. It's not probably a surprise for anybody a listener to popular songs in the last ten years. One of the things that's interesting is is you'll see when we look at the profanity you'll see it happening on the both sides of it, right? Ones for ones not popular as well as popular. And so this was something that when Taylor took a look at this, he was just like, wait a minute, what is it about these words? Maybe we should drill in a little bit more into the types of words there are. And he actually built a couple of extra features in his data set. So this is what his data set looked like. And he wanted to explore this idea of profanity a little bit more. So. He added in some extra features or variables that he generated around how much profanity was there in the song as a percentage. How many words actually showed up? And then he took, used a simple sentiment score based on the lyrics as well. So just trying to get a little bit more information out of those lyrics to bring into the model. Okay. So then we threw those in the model, where we built the model. We've got that running here. Now we can, let's go ahead and mine the model a little bit, try to understand what's going on. Typically when folks are start looking at the model, I have them look at what we call feature impact. What are the variables that are driving the model? Here you can see, for example, genre was the most important piece when we wanted to start thinking about popularity. Um, the day of the week for when the album released, it comes out as important. I didn't mine into this. I know when I did the analysis of movies, for example, there are movies, there are certain months of the year which are known as like dog months for movies, right? Like in August, nobody releases a hit movie because in August, most people are busy out at the beach, summertime, right? School starting, they're not ready to watch movies. So the dumpiest movies get released then. So I'm wondering if there's like a day of the week phenomenon, if like the hits get released on Thursday or Friday. Um, see, song lyrics came into play, and then some of our other features here, like energy and danceability as well. So now let's drill into those a little bit and try to understand what's going on. So I'm going to switch here to... Am I, am I losing my signal there? Okay. <coughs> it's tough with the screen here. Okay. So here's that profanity again. Now you can see, as we add more words, right, popularity goes up. But you also hit a point of diminishing returns. So this is why right, songs that are entirely profanity aren't huge. So, but there is a balance between having a, some profanity and getting your song to be popular. All right? See, it's always fun doing these because like, we all kind of, at a level, understand the intuition between what makes a popular song and what doesn't. We all have some type of history with it, so it's fun to kind of look at these. Here's the duration of the song. So this is, it's in milliseconds at the bottom. But basically, a song that's about three minutes long is the ones that are likely to be the most popular. I mean, you think about it, right? A really short song probably isn't long, isn't there. And a five or six minute song, that's gonna be way too long to ever kind of be popular. Let's keep looking at a couple of these things. So energy is another interesting one. So this is one of the Spotify features. And you can think of something that has high energy is really aggressive and going. So like the death metal music, that's the stuff that has high energy. But you can see when you look at the kind of the, the analysis here, once we built the model and learned that historical information, that if you build a song with more energy, it's likely to drop in popularity. Do one or two more of these like this. So here's danceability. 
So danceability is just how fun and dancing the song is. And here you can see the exact opposite relationship, right? The songs that are fun to dance with actually are much higher, much more likely to be um, popular. Does this make sense to folks? Okay. So this was kind of some of the pieces that we can kind of look in. Here's the percent probability. You can see a similar relationship too, right? That as the percentage goes up, it drops. Okay. All right. So I wanted to do one other thing was, so this is how I usually teach people um, to help interpret and understand what's going on with their models. Is first think about what is the big variables driving your model? What's most important? Next, what's the directionality? How are those variables affecting each model. And then the last piece I always encourage people to do is use some type of explanations where if you have a particular prediction, can we understand what are the variables or features driving that? And so this will be harder again for the people in the back to read, but this is just an example of a couple of the, couple of the um, songs that were in the data set where we can have some explanations of ones that are predicted to be either really popular or not so popular. So I took a look at the ones here that were um, not so popular, um, and if you can see why, right, the genre is dance, pop, pop, rap, right, pretty short duration, no profanity, right, we know that you want a little bit of profanity in there, um, and one of the things we actually have in here is the artist, so the artist here is Nino and Veens, I don't, do you have any, anybody have any idea of Nino, yeah. It's probably right. It makes sense that they're not popular. And I actually did kind of, the, I, I, or Nico and Fiends, I actually did the Google search on that. Um, and it's a Norwegian duo, right? So, I mean, it, the, nothing in here sounds mass market, super popular, does it, um, when you have this kind of a North, we, we doing like R&B or something like that. So, yeah, it's genre Afrobeat, hip hop, and R&B. Um, so... <laughs> The model works well, they probably recognize that this is not going to be the most popular music around. On the other hand, um, if we look at the examples up here at the top, the ones that it's predicting are going to be very high. Some of these songs here, we get Cardi B's in there. Where was it? I think one of them was a Drake song as well. So it kind of seemed to line up with kind of what it is. And, uh, my buddy Taylor actually used this before the Grammy Awards this last year um, to predict which one is likely to win the Grammy. He got lucky. I mean, machine learning gets you so far, but you also need a lot of luck for predicting something like that. And he actually predicted the winner of the Grammy Awards um, using this exact same algorithm as well. Let me stop there, um, see if there's any kind of questions. I can go in a little more, more detail on this where I can talk about the Game of Thrones one as well. Does this make sense to people? Any big questions? No, go ahead. Do you have any idea how Spotify calculates things like danceability? I think if you read their API, the documentation there, it tells you a little bit more about it. I, I don't know in detail um, for that how that does, but the API kind of has that information here. Um, for the, so, but Spotify is usually pretty transparent on a lot of things. They share a lot of the data science stuff as well. So, Other questions? Do you want to talk Game of Thrones? Does that make sense? And this one I don't have a model as much, but it's an interesting one to talk about from a data science perspective. Um, so let's... So one of the things, right, if you watch Game of Thrones, we know they kill off characters all the time. So this is another fun one to be able to kind of predict who's going to die in Game of Thrones. Um, the nice thing is, is there's some data sets for people who've kind of spent some time studying Game of Thrones that have built out there. And yeah, you can see this is kind of a, a web app out of kind of the University of Munich built this out. <coughs> and so they have a data set, I have no idea, 2,000 characters if you look at all five um, 
all five books in that. So this is going to be our starting point for learning to evaluate or validate our model. We're going to take some people that we actually know, some actual characters out, um, to see, be able to validate, is our model working or not. Now, one of the things is this type of problem seems pretty straightforward. You want to predict who's going to die, and you have a bunch of data to do it. But sometimes you have to think a little bit more carefully about the data that you have and how appropriate it is. So one of the things is a bunch of this information came from various books over time. So you think about sometimes somebody dies in the first book, are they going to show up in the fourth book? There's kind of things that happen over time like that. And so one of the things that commonly happens in data science, and it's part of this problem, is something known as target leakage, where when you want to, when you want to use data in your model, you need to make sure that that data is going to be available at prediction time. It's very easy to get information about if this person has died that happened in book four for example, and your model will cheat and learn that information. So a simple example I give with um, loans all the time is you want to predict if somebody's going to default on the loan. And you have a data set of you know, their income and all of that, but somebody might have put in a column that says the recovery fee for the loan. And if you didn't pay attention to that column, right, the only time you're going to have a recovery fee is if the person actually defaulted on the loan. So those types of errors can sneak in all the time when you're building out models. So you have to kind of carefully think about all the information you're using and whether it's fair to use it. And I'll tell you, data scientists, they don't really often mind if these errors creep in because it makes their models look good, right? If you have this kind of target leakage, your model's gonna have a really good performance. So it's no fun sometimes when we kind of point out, hey, wait a minute, should you be using that data? Does it make sense? But on the other hand, if you don't catch it, when you actually go use your model, it's going to fall apart. It's going to have horrible performance because you don't actually have that information. So when you actually go through this, there, this is the visual representation of that. So when you actually go through all the data that they have, you end up seeing that, oh, wait a minute. There's a lot of things in pre-book characters. Well, what happens if you use a popularity score? This is the same thing we ran into with when I was doing the uh, movie awards. Lots of movies get popular after they win an award. So if you just look at popularity score today, that's not the same thing as at the time the award show might have happened. Does that make sense? So th these are the subtleties. And I'll give you another example of a, a real world example of that. Um, lots of, one of the biggest one of the biggest variables people will use in around predicting the economy is, um, what is it called, non-farm payroll. Basically, the unemployment number is often used in models when you're building out things. Now, what most people aren't aware of it is that that number is continually updated. So when they release the, what, what, what month are we in, April or something like that now, when they release April's, April's um, unemployment rate, they might go back and change February's or last December's rate. And so when you're grabbing that data from last year or six months ago, you don't know if that was actually when it was that month or if it's been since updated. So these are the types of subtle issues that kind of you have to think about when you're doing machine learning is, is that the actual value at that time or has it been updated since then? Does that make sense? Okay, I saw a few nods, a few people kind of got that. Okay. Then some of the very, some of the some of the information was great, but it just wasn't there very often. If you don't have enough examples from that, the machine learning algorithms can't learn from it, so it doesn't make any sense to include it. So I think when Taylor ended up doing this, he ended up with about um, how we have zero good relatives. He ended up with a kind of a final set of features like this. And again, you can go grab this data set. It's publicly available. I think nowadays about four or five different organizations have made different Game of Thrones things, characters. But based on that, and then you can read his blog post, he was able to kind of take advantage of that and kind of build out a model to help predict um, 
who's going to die next. All right. Any more? Any questions around this? I can talk more about other stuff. But... Oh, oh, go ahead. What is the culture feature? The culture feature. The social group to which a character belongs. I'd have to look at the data set itself. I don't know off the top head. And again, if you want to grab the data set, it's pretty easy to. It's a kind of a nice publicly available data set. If you just Google Game of Thrones out there, you could go grab it and play around with it. Anybody have target leakage stories they need to share? Okay. Any more announcements or anything? Or? Uh, any other questions for Jeeve? to uh, Joe and Rajiv for presenting today. We'll be back. Uh, we should be back in June. I think July we're going to take off because that's going to be the holiday week. Uh, I'll try to get these slides, if, if Joe and Rajiv can give me their slides sometime soon, I'll get those up on the Meetup page if you want to reference those uh, as resources or any further uh, investigation. So thank you all for coming out. We'll see you again in June.